Hi, I'm Steve. Thanks for being with us for our 20th episode. We have a jam-packed program, including part two of our interview with recreational boating industry icon, Leon Slickers. This week's episode of Boat Test Reports is sponsored by Grady White Boats, which is building boats for both anglers and the family. In Florida, the Lionfish Challenge has been extended to November 1st. As of early August, 558 people have registered for the challenge and 113 people have submitted lionfish. Throughout the state, there are 46 checkpoints for recreational participant submissions. The program began May 1st and was expected to run through Labor Day. Florida Fish and Wildlife wants the invasive venomous lionfish removed from state waters because the species is a vicious predator that breeds and matures rapidly. Specifically, it threatens Florida's coral reefs because lionfish prey on the fish that maintain healthy reefs. In humans, the venom from the tips in their spines can cause pain, vomiting, fever, diarrhea, heart failure, and even death. For the first time in years, the average age of a recreational boat buyer has dropped. Through mid-2020, the average age of new power boat buyers decreased by almost two years compared to the same period last year. According to Infolink Technologies, a Florida firm that tracks new and used boat registrations, for the first time in a decade, the number of new boat buyers under the age of 40 surpassed the number of buyers over 60. Personal watercraft saw the average age of a buyer drop about a year to 46, and wake sports boats saw the number decline to 47. Runabouts and jet boats also lowered to 49. Infolink owner Jack Ellis said the drop is being driven in large part by buyers who still have children in the home and are seeking a way to escape. As we reported last week, the Yamaha Watercraft Group is celebrating its 35th anniversary with the company's largest introduction of new models in its history. On the boat side, there are eight new models, including a 25-foot center console and bow riders with a focus on wake surfing. Yamaha's drive steering system that has paddle-style throttle controls on the wheel is featured in many of the new boats. The center consoles have 111-gallon fuel tanks, plus a live well, and the bench seat abaft the helm folds down to create a casting platform. Finally, for 2021, there are four new 21-foot boats. All feature Yamaha's E-Series drive-by-wire system with push-button start-stop, RPM engine sync, and single throttle lever pairing. They also have a 12.3-inch Kinext helm screen that lets the driver set and save acceleration curves and speed up preferences for up to five riders. Also new for 2021 is the Wake Sutter 24 MXZ from Malibu Boats. The boat is a redesign of one of the company's most popular models. The boat features Malibu's wake shaping elements like surf gate, EMLX electric fast ballast fill, quad hard tank ballast, and the Power Wedge 3. The stern turn system uses a thruster to reduce turning radius so a driver can get to a fallen rider more quickly. The boat is powered by a Malibu Monsoon M6 DI engine that the company says produces 606 foot-pounds of torque at 3,800 RPM. Earlier this week, Mercury Marine introduced its new wake surfing drive, the Bravo 4S. The engine manufacturer is pairing the drive with Smart Tow, a new drive system for Merc Cruiser engines designed to create wakes for surfing and boarding. The Bravo 4S has the stainless steel propellers on the front of the drive with a four-blade wheel spinning ahead of a three-blade. Five new propellers were developed for the drive and it's compatible with the 250 horsepower Merc Cruiser 4.5 liter V6 as well as the 6.2 liter 350 horsepower 8.1 liter 430 horsepower V8s. Digital controls coordinate the ballast, surf tabs, and propulsion settings via a SmartCraft digital touch screen. With a few taps, the driver can select the desired sport and the system will display the appropriate controls to set launch, acceleration, towing, speed, and wake size along with the shape. Keep an eye out for a BoatTest.com evaluation of a boat equipped with the Bravo 4S soon. Hello Marine's Seahawk XL dual color LED lights can help improve vision at night and during stormy conditions. They can be switched between two colors and are available in three combinations. The lights put out 750 lumens with a 76 degree spread. The housing is made from corrosion resistant polymer that's thermally conductive so the elements stay cool, are sealed to IP67 standards, mount on a stainless steel bracket and come pre-wired with an 8 foot cable. Retail pricing starts at $299. As we continue to look at useful knots, the sheet bend is used to create a strong link between two lines of different thicknesses. Here's the trick to make sure it's tied correctly. Now a variation on the bowline is the sheet bend. It's used for joining two sections of line. 
We start by putting a bend in the line, and then we take our next line, and it comes up, around underneath, and then back through. And now you've got two lines joined together, nice and solid. And again, it starts with making a bend in the first line, bringing the second line up through, around underneath, and then back through, just like that. And like the bowling, no matter how tight you pull it, you can undo it. We just bend it over like that. Today, we look at Hampton Yacht's 72-foot endurance and zero in on important details that should be on any yacht in this class to make the boat easy to handle for an owner-operator. Let's take a look. Starting at the helm, three 21-inch Garmin displays provide all the course and system monitors a captain needs, including cameras throughout the boat. For redundancy, the stabilizer controls are near the thrusters because the panel can be used to operate the thrusters as a backup. The same panel can also be used to control the windlass. On the 72 Endurance, wing stations are in fold-out compartments that keep them protected from the elements. A watertight door on the transom provides entry to the crew quarters that leads to the engine room. The compartment has abundant space around the twin 1136 horsepower CAT C18 engines and their 6 feet 11 inches of headroom. Levers on the front of the fuel filters make it easy to change on the fly and there are even lighted sight tubes for the fuel tanks. These details are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to covering all the bases on a Hampton yacht. Check out the full video at BoatTest.com. Last week we found out how Leon Slickers, the owner of Tierra, started his career making wood boats for Chris Craft. Today, Boat Test founder Jeff Hammond explores with him his transition from wood to fiberglass boat building. How long did you build wood boats before you started thinking about fiberglass? In late 56 and early 57, I started to fool around with fiberglass. I got acquainted with a chemist from Zealand, and in 1958, I made my own fiberglass uh, hall and deck. And the first ones that I made were, I didn't have the color in them. But 1958, I made my first all fiberglass boat. And uh, it was, it was uh, the color of gel coat was in a red deck. So. Did you, <laughs> did you, uh, did you make molds for them or? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. I, I made the molds. Yes, I did. Yeah. And did you make those yourself? Yes, I did. Yes, he, he, he helped me. That must have been a me. tremendous job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a good experience. By 1962, from the time I was making wood boats and glass boats, and in 1962 at the uh, Chicago Trade Sh uh, Navy Pier, I had an all-black 16-footer there with white pinstripe deck and a red leather interior and a white shag carpet. It was, I believe, it was a hit of the show. I knew then that. I had hit the mark and I knew surely that I was gonna to come to the fork in the road that I couldn't do, keep on making wood boats and glass. So in 1962, I made the decision to go to all fiberglass. But was it faster to build in fiberglass than wood? I don't think it was faster. It was easier to make a boat out of fiberglass than out of wood. And I knew that that would be the future. I really thought that that's the future. At that time, I had about five competitors that I knew very well. And when I start fooling with fiberglass, I knew that they did not. And it was Dumpy, Wagemaker, Yellow Jacket, and, uh, Delta, and Milo Craft out of Chicago. I think Cruisers Incorporated up in, uh, they were all wood. They had not started with fiberglass. And so I thought, well, I'm really taking a risk and chance here, but it paid off. People were saying horrible things about fiberglass. Oh, they, were they ever? <laughs> yeah, they had us. They had us stay and said, if uh, we were supposed to make boats out of fiberglass, we'd have made fiberglass trees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they said worse things than that. Like, yeah, <laughs> they looked like the inside of a, a refrigerator. The first fiberglass boats weren't very. Uh, I think was the benefit that I had is that I tried to make my fiberglass boats look like wood. 
And they, and they were looked like wood boats. You couldn't hardly tell them the difference except that they were painted instead of varnished. How did you make them look like wood boats? Well, I even had the uh, deck grooved like a like a deck boat on a, on a mahogany deck where the fin striped. I even had that in fiberglass. I would pin stripe them. I, I would see. do that myself at night. So. I see. Now, why didn't Chris Craft uh, uh, jump on fiberglass right away? They were afraid of the material at first, and they started to use fiberglass for their cabins. So how long did you uh, build Slick Craft? I sold the company in 69 to AMF in New York City. Uh, they had just gone into the boat business. Uh, Hatteras, they had acquired. Crestliner, uh, they had Elkhart, the Sunfish boats. You remember those? Oh, certainly uh, do. Were you the biggest uh, builder of, of fiberglass runabouts in 69? No, not at that time. Uh, Glass Bar, I think, was the biggest at that time. It gave me a good business training. I had not had a lot of the formal education, and so sitting there at the table with a lot of other executives that run businesses was helpful. Uh, I feel they sent me to Harvard for uh, four years. <laughs> well, you, you <laughs> and, learned and the lessons very well. Yeah, I guess I wouldn't have never had the training of running a big company if I had not had that experience with AMF. I, you know, a lot of people ask me, how did you, why did you ever sell Slickcraft? I think my first reason to selling to AMF was that I was afraid I would not be able to compete with the big builders. I had limited capital at that time. I come from a poor family, Jeff. Um, so there was not very much money in our family. So I was a little bit concerned that I would, in the big scale of things, uh, that I would not be able to compete. As I look back, I definitely can see it that, you know, about every two months we'd have to go to New York and sit there with all the, uh, the other executives and make our our cases, our presentations, and so forth. And so, it's a good training for me. Good training. Next week, Leon Slickers looks back on his 75 years in the business and explains why boats have gotten so expensive and, by inference, how people can save money when buying a new boat. Be sure to watch it. Now, let's take a commercial break for this week's sponsor, Grady White Boats. Let's take a look at a question from the captain's exam. Which light display would mark the opening in a pipeline where vessels could pass through? A, three red lights in a vertical line on each side of the opening. B, two red lights in a vertical line on each side of the opening. C, three white lights in a vertical line on each side of the opening. Or D, two white lights in a vertical line on each side of the opening. And the answer is B, two red lights in a vertical line. You can pass through between them only. Well, that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching and keep those questions, pictures and videos coming. I'm Captain Steve and as always, I'll see you on the water.